Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar series for pharmacy addressing the COVID crisis and open forum. And I'm really excited to be here today to host uh, this, this webinar. My name is Sandra Leal, and I'm the Executive Vice President at Symphonia Rx, a tabula rasa healthcare solution. I'm here in Tucson today, and I'm also uh, president of the American Pharmacists Association. So this is my first webinar as president, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk about a topic that's really uh, important to me. Uh, today, we'll be talking about COVID-19 and the impact uh, on patients with diabetes. Um, so we'll be talking about medication management, we'll be talking about access to care, vaccine eligibility, and then lifestyle issues associated um, with diabetes and COVID. So hopefully you'll hear from an incredible uh, couple of speakers that we have that that have joined us this morning. So I'm excited to share um, with you that we have Diana Isaacs. She is a PharmD uh, board certified pharmacist. She is also a cert certified diabetes care and education specialist. That's the new acronym for CDE. Um, Diana is great. She is incredibly phenomenal, has a ton of experience in diabetes, and I'm uh, happy to follow her on social media because she does a lot of work uh, to promote the role of pharmacists in diabetes management and care. But let me read a little bit about her. Uh, she is uh, an endocrinology clinical pharmacy specialist and remote monitoring and CGM program coordinator at the Cleveland Clinic Diabetes Center. She holds board certifications in pharmacotherapy, ambulatory care, advanced diabetes management, and is involved in several national uh, associations representing pharmacy and diabetes. So uh, it's a pleasure to have her this morning joining us to address some of the concerns uh, around diabetes and COVID. We also have with us this morning, Tammy Lopez. She is a pharmacy manager and clinical pro program coordinator at Maxwell National Pharmacy Services um, and is a clinical associate professor at my alma mater, the University of Colorado Skag School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. She is also the owner and CEO of Life Engagement, um, of Life Engagement Achieves Purpose Leap Functional Medicine, a company that helps patients achieve their health goals by getting to the root cause of their disease or health issues, um, including triggers such as poor nutrition and lifestyle factors. So, so these are a couple of wonderful uh, clinicians that have a lot of experience managing diabetes. Um, we also have our subject matter experts. These are our uh, staff here at APHA, Mitch uh, Rothholz. He's the Chief of Governance and State Affiliates. Um, he is also the APHA Executive Director of the APHA Foundation, and he has a long history of working uh, as our APHA vaccine experts with a lot of relationships with uh, organizations like the CDC. Um, our next guest is Dan Zlot. He's the SVP of Education and Business Development at APHA, and he brings over 10 years of experience working at the NIH. Um, he has a lot of experience in oncology and infectious disease, and I'm sure you've been following some of his educational information um, uh, series on COVID vaccines and um, anything related to research related to COVID. So welcome, Dan. Uh, we also have Elisa Bernstein. She's our SVP for Pharmacy Practice and Government Affairs. She also brings 30 years of experience working with the FDA, and she will uh, be giving us an update towards the end of this session, uh, talking about updates related to APHA and governance. So let me review a little bit on the format for today's webinar. Um, we will go through the introductions, um, and then at, at about 105, we're gonna have an interview with Diana and Tammy, and they'll share a little bit about their experiences. Uh, we will then at 125 have an open forum where we want to hear your questions and your thoughts uh, around anything that you're hearing or just concerns that you've been experiencing within your own practice uh, related to patients with diabetes. And, you know, we know that about one in 10 Americans uh, have diabetes. So this is a, a condition that we see often in our practices. So it's going to be great to have um, these two speakers share their experience and hopefully you can add to that uh, dialogue when we get to that point. At 1.50, we will have Elisa Bernstein give us an update on things going on with APHA, and then we'll share some additional resources and information throughout the session. Um, so as we go on, uh, I wanted to point out that we have uh, a question field on the right-hand side of your screen. Please feel free to go to that question uh, area and either add comments or questions, and we will try to get through them as we're having the discussion um, or 
in the open question and answer dialogue. There's also a great handout that is included that you can download. Uh, there are a lot of links in there, a ton of resources to reference back after this session and some live links that you can connect through with a handout. So hopefully that'll be a good resource to you um, post uh, town hall. This session will be recorded and it will be posted uh, at the APHA uh, Resource Center, so you can always go back and look at it uh, anytime later for, in for any information that you find. Right. So let's go ahead and get started um, with a discussion with Diana and Tammy. I'm going to ask them to uh, light up their video here so we can meet them. Um, and we will start with some questions. Hi, Diana, and hi, Tammy. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm excited to talk to the both of you about a a topic that's uh, dear to me. I am also a certified diabetes care and education specialist, so it's nice to have both of you on. And uh, I know that you are incredibly knowledgeable about this. So I wanted to start off and um, ask you about how you've been impacted by COVID-19 and how this has impacted your practice. Um, so maybe we want to start with you, Tammy, if you can talk a little bit about uh, what you've been seeing out in the field and some of your experiences just in the last few months to this past year. Sure, thank you. I appreciate the introduction. Um, so I run the retail pharmacy as well as the clinical program through um, so for the city government uh, of Colorado Springs. So I work for Maxter National Pharmacies and we operate the, the pharmacy for the city government. So we initially we do retail as well as the mail order. So what we ran into is you know having to close down our doors, not getting patients to walk in, having to switch solely to uh, mail order to kind of limit any interactions with patients. Um, we also have been seeing with the clinical programs is switching from in-person visits to figuring out a virtual uh, procedure. So switching from um, doing our education modules, you know, through computers, through, through Zoom, um, as well as just finding that way to connect with our patients. Uh, so the one thing that really was beneficial as well is that we were able to connect with a lot of the uh, like uh, CGMs as well as our glucometers that we can uh, remotely access. So that made it a little bit easier. So even though it was a kind of a quick thing that we had to do, it actually transitioned pretty easily. Great, thank you. And how about you, Diana? I know you're in a slightly different practice if you wanna talk a little bit about your experience. Sure, well, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm at the Cleveland Clinic Diabetes Center in an ambulatory care practice. Um, and seeing patients and managing their medications. And, you know, when COVID hit, it was really a big transformation to virtual care. Before COVID, believe it or not, we were actually, we were doing some virtual visits, but it was like a handful. And for a couple months there, we were doing all virtual and now it's very much a hybrid. And we had to learn really quickly how to get, you know, up to speed with, with technology and make sure we can access everyone. And you know we've we've expanded a lot with the use of glucose monitoring, whether that's Bluetooth connected meters or you know continuous glucose meters with the mobile apps. But figuring out how can we get data because it's really hard to do a virtual visit if you have no data and no information. And so that's something we've really pushed for. Even you know I manage a lot of patients on insulin pumps and you know trying to teach them how to get the data. And there's been some learning curves too with what is the best mechanism in terms of reaching out to people in advance and getting a hold of them. Earlier in COVID, it was kind of nice because everybody was home, so it was easier to get a hold of everyone. Uh, now it's, you know, sometimes people are more out and about, but we've also kind of transferred more to a hybrid model. So that's helped a, a bit too. That's that's very interesting. Yeah, I know, um, you know, I've, I, I've shared this um, during my presentation at APHA that my daughter was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes last February, so right before the pandemic, and it was quite interesting to try to access an endocrinologist, and we did it all remotely during uh, this time, so it was really great from an access point of view, but some of the things that we were challenged with was uh, getting labs because, you know, we weren't going anywhere. We were trying to really stay away and, and not be uh, uh, exposing um, her or ourselves, especially with having type 1. We were concerned about uh, the severity of that and and potentially having COVID. Have you seen that be a concern with your patients? Have you seen have them having either worse outcomes or what kind of um, concerns have the patients expressed who you've been working with? Yeah, I, I can take this one. So some people have been really fearful to come in and that's been a barrier because, you know, for some people I've been able to manage them pretty well with virtual visits, but some, it, it has been a struggle to get the data 
and I really would like them to come in and I worry so much about them um, because they're not they're they're afraid to come in and it's you know you or it's hard to to get a hold of them and so I think that has been a very real fear I've tried to instill in people that we're probably you know one of the safest places to be with all the protocols and everything um, but I know people have been really afraid to get care during this time and that we know can sometimes lead to worse outcomes. So that's been kind of one of the, the problematic things. But to your point, I, <clears throat> you know, I've had stories also where, you know, I, I actually, there's one patient I'm thinking of who was newly diagnosed, I think it was in March of last year. And, you know, it was similar. He, he came into clinic, um, brand new type one diabetes, but then all of the care after that was virtual. And uh, in fact, he lived three hours away. So that was also the added convenience, but it, the, actually that case worked just so, so well. We had the connected data we were really able to manage it very well, and um, he's doing tremendously. So I think I've, I've seen kind of both sides of the coin. Yeah. And how about you, Tammy? How have you um, seen patients either respond positively or had they had fear, access to medication issues, uh, if you can share? Sure. So uh, speaking to, um, you know, not being able to go in to get labs and not being able to see their doctor, you know, we really didn't have any updated A1Cs and we couldn't do them in office because our building was closed. Uh, so what we did find though with transitioning patients, uh, those who are not are already on like a glucometer that we were able to remotely access, we were able to get the Freestyle Libre uh, sensors available to the patients at no charge. So we were able to start a lot more patients on that, get their information pretty readily also looking at those glucose management indicators. So at least we could say, okay, well, based on where you're currently at, this is where we can anticipate where your A1C is. Uh, in addition, you know, with the patients who are on insulin pumps, we had um, a couple of pe people switching over, transitioning or upgrading to insulin pumps, doing insulin pump trainings virtually, which was a new thing as well. But being able to at least see where they're at and knowing that even though, because uh, we don't particularly bill for our services. So if we had somebody who, had any issues, it's like, hey, can you pull up my information real quick? Let's do a quick phone call, especially if their blood sugar levels were high, uh, then, you know, at least it was a little bit more accessible mm -hmm. for the patient. But yes, they were not going to get their eye exam, dental exams, obviously that, you know, they, they couldn't because a lot of places were closed. But that was one thing we struggled with that we usually track is with the, the, the lab data. We did not have that available um, in regards to, um, I'm sorry, what, what the, the other question was, uh, I'm trying to think of what the other question was. Oh, was just anything, uh, no, any suggestions that you had for patients, anything around access or availability of their insulin or? Yeah. Well, and that was the other thing, I apologize. Uh, one thing that we did see initially is when we closed the pharmacy, we were not getting a readily available amount of Humalog. So that was our biggest issue. We were, you know, having to fill a lot of albuterol scripts and so we're running low on that, the Humalog. So at our pharmacy, we actually do the mail order. So our patients, type one patients can get three months at a time. So we kind of had to allocate giving a month at a time, making sure staying on top, contacting our patients, seeing how much insulin that they had. Uh, Cause we are closed pharmacy, so we don't have just walk-in patients. So our, our um, our customers are, are pretty regular. So staying on top of that, making sure what they had, what they needed. We don't have another nearby pharmacy in our state. We are a national uh, pharmacy company. So we actually contacted one of our company uh, affiliates in uh, Houston, and they were able to order us a whole bunch to get them in so that we can be on top of our patients and making sure they're getting what they needed. Oh, that's great. Wow. Yeah, and I've seen so many pharmacists just having to do some incredible things to um, help their patients out and accommodate, you know, access and shipping and answering questions. Um, I want to go back to you, Diane. I know that you were talking a lot about remote monitoring within your practice, and um, I know there's a lot of interest for pharmacists that are on to know about what kind of opportunities are there for uh, compensation for sustainability around monitoring patients. If you wanted to share your experience with that, because I know that's one of the key areas of your practice. Yeah, I'd love to. So yeah, one of the things we started at Cleveland Clinic in 2020 was a remote monitoring program. And, you know, in this program, we really, a bunch of kind of newer codes became available to be able to bill for these services. And we tried out basically, yeah, you can see the codes here. We tried them out. And so the ones I'm most familiar with that we use in my practice are the 99457 and the 99458. And typically I'm remote monitoring patients that have connected glucose meters. So typically Bluetooth meters or patients with CGM. 
And it's been really great because now it's a way that I can kind of bill for the services I was in the past actually doing for free. And what it entails is it's basically the first code, the 99457 is 20 minutes of remote monitoring. And this can actually be exchanges through phone, virtually, my chart messages, um, the kind of all the modes of communication. But I review the data. A lot of times I'll set up a virtual visit, discuss with a patient and adjust therapies through my consult agreement, through the collaborative practice agreement. And these codes can be billed by pharmacists. So the one caveat is, you know, it's billed under, um, I list kind of the, I, I bill it under a physician, but I'm the service provider. And I bill anywhere, the first 20 minutes is the 99457. And then uh, you can do up to 60 minutes where then you would add on that 99458. And through our pilot, we have learned, we've been uh, pleasantly surprised that a lot of payers are paying for these. So Medicare has been covering Medicaid and then commercial insurers, it is a little bit, there are a couple that are not, but we were pleasantly surprised to see that many are starting to cover these. So I think this is a tremendous opportunity and yeah, we're continuing to grow our program. That's great. I see that you have another slide for more codes. Um, see, there we go. Yeah, so we also bill, like another thing I do is I bill the CGM interpretation codes. And so I do a lot of CGM in my practice and there's a few different codes for starting someone up on a personal CGM device. There's the 95249 code that can only be billed once in the device, uh, once in the life of a device. But the 95251 is the interpretation code. And depending on someone's insurance, that can be billed up to once a month or quarterly or every six months. So I'm doing kind of a combination of the CGM codes with the remote monitoring. We typically keep the 95251 to quarterly when they come in um, or for their endocrinology office visits. And then in between that month to month ma management, I'm using the remote monitoring codes. So um, right. yeah, it's a big, they've been a big part of my practice. And for those that aren't familiar with CGM, it's continuous glucose monitor, which is uh, incredible. My daughter started off with the Libre, like you were discussing Tammy earlier. Um, she started poking herself and then the Libre made it amazingly manageable. And then we could share the information with the provider. And then just recently she got on the continuous glucose monitor, um, which has been even more incredible because she gets readings all the time now and we are able to go to bed and it alerts us if she's you know going low and a lot of peace of mind with that so this is a wonderful tool uh, for people who have to deal with diabetes and it's great the pharmacist can now leverage some of um, these codes to be able to then work with patients to keep them well controlled and managed so thank you both for sharing that experience um how about questions related to just vaccine access for your patients with type 1 or type 2. Have you seen any concerns within your states around um, whether or not they qualify for vaccinations? I know this, there's been such a change in uh, recommendations, but has that been an issue for access or, or worse outcomes for one type of diabetes versus the other? Anything like that that you'd like to share? And I'll start with you, Tammy. Sure. Um, based on what Colorado has, they did not differentiate between type 1 and type 2. I do know some of my patients have already gotten their vaccinations. I have not heard from many of my patients of having any issues. I think now it's being more readily available and there's clinics being offered, uh, but I haven't heard any. Um, we don't offer vaccinations where we're at currently. We have another department that does that, um, but we haven't seen uh, any issues or anybody kind of discussing any major obstacles with that. Yeah, about there's you? a lot of controversy around this issue um, because, you know, first they were saying people with type 2 diabetes and then they gave preference to people with type 1 diabetes in our state, but they said they had to have a hospitalization within the last year. Severe type 1 diabetes was the term. And so that caused, you know, people were pretty frustrated with that because it's like, oh, I have to go in the hospital to be able to get a vaccine. So there was definitely some frustration. Uh, there's some advocacy around this area that why, you know, why would you give preference to one type of diabetes, especially when there's really uh, can be a lot of similarities. So the good news is now things have really sped up in our state where there are now more and more people are eligible, you know, and so that it's kind of become now we're past that. But at the time, it was, you know, pretty frustrating kind of how it was decided who should get and, and who shouldn't get. 
Yeah, no, I had the same uh, issues here in Arizona where people with certain age groups and uh, type one wasn't included initially, type two was. I have great news. My daughter, who is uh, 17, actually got her vaccine yesterday at 2.30, oh. which was like a huge relief, uh, but they opened it up at 8 a.m. yesterday morning and she was able to get the vaccine. So now they're really just opening up to awesome. adults and I'm seeing more and more states, uh, I think Texas and uh, other states are now opening up to 16 uh, and older. So. Uh, that's great news. So we're starting to see that. Are you uh, at all seeing any vaccine hesitancy among uh, the patients that you're working with? Or any confidence with a vaccine issue or any hesitancy that you're noting with uh, the populations that you're working with? Yeah, I mean, there definitely is some. I ask all my patients about it if they've been vaccinated because I want to open up that discussion and let them know I, I advocate they should should get it. Um, there is some hesitancy. Some people, you know, uh, th through the process, they're they're skeptical. And so I just try to give them, you know, the scientific facts about them, encourage them to get it. I am seeing that I feel like the vaccination rates are going up. People are starting to feel more comfortable as it's been around now for a few months. But yeah, we still, there's still a lot of work to do to, to show people it's safe and to boost people's confidence in getting it. And not just the people with diabetes, but their family members. Mm -hmm. I have one patient, she's like pretty immunocompromised in addition to also having diabetes. And her spouse is so skeptical about getting the vaccine. And so, you know, that's a case I'm working on, but we, we you know, there's still a lot of work to do in this area. Yeah. Absolutely. And our and pharmacy, yeah, we have a lot of first responders. So majority of our patients are already getting their, their vaccination. We have, you know, our police officers or firefighters, the ones that are not first responders, we kind of have about a, probably a 50-50. Of, you know, some are already starting to get them, some are hesitant, want to see a little bit more data to see, you know, what's going on, hearing about, you know, how sick they can get on possibly on, on you know, any particular shot. So it is building up and I think people are feeling, feeling a little bit more comfortable, but I think what they would really like to do is just kind of be able to have more of that ease of being out in public and not have to take as many precautions if they do get that vaccination. No, absolutely. Um, and, and talking about being out there in lifestyle, how has the pandemic impacted your patients regarding lifestyle management and nutrition. Have you seen anything related to, you know, access to food issues or exercise issues um, during the pandemic that you started to talk to your patients about? Yeah, initially when everything happened, including myself, you know, when everything happened, it was what can you find? And the biggest thing was, you know, processed food, something that, you know, that was on the shelf because all the, the, you know, produce and meat and everything was gone. So initially, yes, it was a big, uh, a big obstacle for my patients. And it was like, okay, how can, how can you manage? Let's just kind of look at carbs, counting carbs, trying to manage with their, um, with their nutrition. As far as exercise, you know, people not going to the gym, it's like, but okay, we get outside. We did have some patients that, you know, we do our quarterly calls. I've had some patients that were like, I haven't even gotten out of the house in, in three months. I'm like, get out, get some air, take your precautions, you know, but get out and get some air. And really, we did a lot of focus on stress management. Uh, we focused on our uh, education modules doing sick day guidelines. It's like, okay, if you're going to get sick, this is what you do. Make sure you have all that you need. Um, type one as, as well as type two. Uh, but as far as the nutrition, yes, it was a big factor in seeing in the blood glucose readings when we were able to access them, uh, that effect on on uh, on their levels. I, as the time has gone by, it's been a little bit better and nutrition, you know, as far as foods being readily accessible. And I think a lot more people now that they've been home are focusing on their health and really getting out. And it's like, okay, if they have to work from home, getting out, exercising and focusing on their health, being with their family. So in a way, it's, it's kind of a, it, it's been helpful to some people in some ways, you know, towards the end, but we are seeing a more of a balance now that it's on a lot of part. And Diana, I know that when we were talking in uh, our planning session, you mentioned people had lost a lot of their health insurance because of, you know, loss of jobs. Um, how has that impacted your population as far as access to their supplies their meters or sensors? Have you uh, seen a lot of that? Has that gotten a little bit better? Uh, if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, so right, a lot of people lost their jobs and then with that they lost their health insurance and so they had to really scramble to, you know, figure out what medications to switch to um, while they're trying to see if they're eligible maybe for Medicaid or Medicare and so that really was was very tough and trying to navigate, okay, what cost savings programs are there 
you know, fortunately there are some there are some good ones for insulin if, for people that have lost their insurance, but definitely, and, and the problem is some people didn't come in right away or didn't contact me right away. So I was able to help them, but some of them went like a month without medication. And so it like breaks your heart that, you know, they're sitting there with really high glucose levels. Um, yeah. And so that I've definitely seen a lot of that. And then I, I also just wanted to comment on, you know, I've seen a lot of the things Tammy seen too, um, the exercise, especially in our area in Ohio. I mean, we had a pretty rough winter. It was really icy out. And so, either with the gyms closed or now the gyms are open but people don't really feel comfortable going to the gyms and so that it's been really tough people have not been getting the physical activity and so that has just been a real real challenge trying to figure out how to squeeze that in with not having the same resources that we're all used to having well i'm glad you mentioned that about you know um the just the help that you you're you can offer patients, especially if they have any break in care or they're having challenges with their health insurance um, or the information around lifestyle and education. I always think that pharmacists play such a significant role in public health and addressing social determinants of health. And I know that both of you are phenomenal resources to that to patients. And I know a lot of people on the call that are seeing patients are sometimes the primary access point for uh, information and advocacy and getting people back on track when they have any bumps in the road there. Um, I know we're going to go into the question and answer sessions from uh, the, the audience here. I did want to mention a resource that APHA put together because there's a lot of interest that I'm seeing on continuous glucose monitoring. It's um, a resource called let's see, personal continuous glucose monitoring implementation playbook. So this resource was put together in collaboration with ADCES, um, APHA and the APHA Foundation. And it is in the handout, there's a link to download it and it gives a lot of information um, around a step-by-step -step, step approach to implement uh, CMG, so continuous glucose monitoring, additional resources and latest research on that. So hopefully you find that of interest and useful as you're trying to go through your practice and p potentially consider this as an opportunity. Um, I also wanted to highlight that we have a section inter interest group on diabetes management. So if you uh, are very interested in this topic, please join. Um, they're actually recruiting right now for membership for these uh, different groups. It is the application is due April 12th, but it is a, a number of different SIGs. One of them happens to be diabetes management, but there's one on medication management, immunization, care for the underserved, public health. So a lot of really great topics there. And there's information around policy, share best practices, um, different things. And you can tap into wonderful resources like Diana and Tammy, who uh, probably at, actually I saw, Diana, you posted recently uh, some information there in one of the recent uh, posts on Engage. So thank you, thank you for doing that. So we will now go to the open forum discussion and see what comments, questions, and feedback is coming through and see what we can answer for you. Um, let's see, there were some questions related to, um, uh, the billing is definitely coming through. It, one of the questions here is, Diana, uh, can you describe again how you bill 99457 and 99458? In California, we've been told pharmacies cannot bill these remote monitoring codes. Um, I'm not sure if you have any specific. So I'm in Ohio, so I, I can't necessarily comment on, on what is happening in California. But what I can say is that, you know, I've, I have been building them and we have been getting reimbursed successfully. There are some certain caveats with these codes. So one I didn't mention is that you do need to have informed consent from the patient. That needs to be documented that they're okay with you doing the service. And then I do bill underneath the physician. So like in my, you know, in our electronic record, when I'm putting the code in, I specifically list the physician, um, the physician on site, and then I'm listed as the service provider. And our billing team has felt very comfortable with this. In fact, before I stepped into the role, we actually had a dietitian that was in the role. And the dietitian was also able to bill these codes in that similar way. So hopefully there's a way, you know, in talking through your team, um, I think these codes are just newer. And so, you know, not everyone is, is familiar and may need some education on getting more comfortable to let us bill for them. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, sometimes, especially it is, is, it is new and sometimes you get pushback from your uh, billing department or your coding department that uh, you might not be doing something uh, that they're comfortable with. So that's why I think some of these uh, communications and engage in getting other, other examples um, and sharing those examples with your, uh, your, your 
health system or your practice can sometimes help advocate for what you're trying to do there. And just to right. add one more thing to that, um, they actually, our team was really happy to change from a dietitian to a pharmacist because one of the, the, the reasons why having a pharmacist in the role is so good is that I can change medications. Mm -hmm. So like the RD was always having to like consult the provider to ask, but through my consult agreement, I can just do it. And so it's actually, I feel like remote monitoring is like a perfect role for a pharmacist. Yeah. I remember I had a similar experience in my practice. We had a registered dietitian and then the pharmacist. And, you know, at first uh, I remember with a registered dietitian, uh, she had thought we were going to be competing with each other. And we ended up being the best advocates for each other because she would send people to me when I needed to change medication under collaborative practice. And then I would send people to her that needed to have all of the lifestyle, nutritional, uh, educational information. So we created referral pathways that were a little bit more clear, but we ended up being each other's uh, best uh, advocates and friends during the time that I was working there. So, uh, but yeah, the providers really appreciated the services. Tammy, do you work with anybody in your practice, other team members like that, or uh, local um, health systems around you? Right, yes, what we do is we have, uh, the city actually has a really good uh, partnership with all their vendors, and they're really good about advocating for their employees. So we always go on quarterly meetings to find out which vendor is offering what service, like we have EAP Employee Assistance Program for you know stress management, things like that. They, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they have a city medical clinic, they have registered dietitians, um, they also have like a healthy you, uh, they do like the employees biometric screening, but we all, refer to each other because we know all the services that are available. So it's really nice to work together and then also be able to tell the patients, you know, these are the benefits or hey, did you know you can get, you know, a set of um, custom made shoes for because you have the diabetes uh, diagnosis and making sure to pass all that along as we meet quarterly to, to kind of, uh, they even have like exercise classes for free. So we make sure that they are, um, and then they also refer, you know, to me for anybody who is newly diagnosed, pre-diabetes, anything like that. But yeah, being able to work together well, it it makes it run nice and smoothly. Great. Um, there's a good question here about telehealth visits and whether or not you've noticed that having telehealth visits help you have a better understanding of the patient's home life um, and how that might impact their care now that you're like literally in the patient's home <laughs> during those home visits. Has that been something that you've noticed or that's helped you in a in a unique way that you had an experience before and I'll start with you Diana yeah so you it is really interesting to see right someone's home life and see what their yeah their living situation looks like I do think it, it gives a nice perspective to better understand them a little bit more also they you know if you ask them to grab something or they they're like oh I don't know what the how many carbohydrates are in that food I can just ask them hey can you go to your pantry and just grab that for me or there's no saying oh I don't have my meter they can just you know go grab it and we can look through that together um it, it's kind of interesting though because not everyone is home anymore like I have this one patient I'm doing the virtual and I'm like are you driving and he's a mailman and he's like on his route and I'm like wow oh, okay stop <laughs> So it's it's kind of interesting. Um, you see people in all different kinds of, of of situations. Have you noticed that you're getting more frequent touch points because it is more convenient to do a televisit versus like physically coming in? Oh, definitely, because it's so easy. I can just say, you know, someone who's having a lot of variability, I can say, hey, let's just, let's touch base next week. Is that okay? And it doesn't even have to be the full long visit. You know, we can just touch base. It's so easy and convenient. So absolutely. That's great. How about you, Tammy? Have you noticed any of that? Yes, well, and I agree with, with being able to, it seems to be more, um, the patients are more readily accessible because yes, they're at home and you get, you know, get more people to show up for their visits. Uh, but as far as being able to see them in their own comfort level, it does help. Um, but like, it's just funny that she says that about like, what are they eating? Yes, they go grab the food and it's like, oh, it's right here. Instead of like, I don't know how many carbs it is or, you know, or just seeing even what they're doing. Uh, some have showed me like, oh, these are the exercise things I'm doing, the exercise equipment. So you kind of get a better understanding of, of what they're, um, what they're doing and being able to okay, offer suggestions to anything. But uh, it's been, we find that it's kind of been a little easier, but yes, now more people are not at home. Now we're doing the hybrid similar to what Diana is doing. Like, you know, they're welcome to come in now or some are still working from home. So we're kind of doing the, uh, both aspects of it. But we find that patients are more, I don't know if it's necessarily more open because they're pretty open here too, but just like they're in their comfort home, you know, comfort level at home and then just able to kind of share more and get more in depth on conversations instead of being rushed to get the next patient out. Oh, that's 
that's do you either of you do group visits? I was just curious about like the DSM team group visits, if that's improved uh, people coming like through Zoom classes instead of uh, face to face, because that's been hard to fill those classes sometimes. Have you had any experience with that? Yeah, so we actually started a gestational diabetes a shared medical appointment that's all virtual. And that's gone really, really well. It's through a collaboration we have with our uh, maternal fetal medicine. And so in that we have a pharmacist, dietitian, and then the physician. And we have, um, we've been doing up to six patients. We're probably gonna increase it, but, um, but it's been really, really great. And we do, because we have so many new diagnosed gestational diabetes, like, patients. So we do all the education virtually. Um, our MFM provider actually takes them out like for 10 minutes to do like a one-on-one -on -one virtual session. And then we're providing like all the education for this new diagnosis. And so we have found that that's worked really well. I think group virtual classes, especially like on a good platform like Zoom, um, assuming it's HIPAA compliant and everything is really, uh, can, can really be great and convenient for people. Yeah, I saw that there was some language to actually include pharmacists for DSMT and telehealth um, recognition there too in the last few months. So that's really exciting progress to include pharmacists as part of that. And hopefully that continues uh, post pandemic. So I appreciate that. How about you, Tammy? Any group classes that you're doing or have you mostly done the one-to-one -one telehealth? We've mainly done the one-to-one, -one. being that we're a closed pharmacy, we're only the city uh, employees and their dependents with respect to privacy. So not a lot of people want to know, you know, um, or anybody else to know, you know, they have diabetes. So we have to try and respect that. So yeah, we've kept them one-to-one. -one. And I saw a great question coming through here about um, new diagnosis uh, post-COVID illness. Have you seen an increased trend in, in people coming in saying, I had COVID-19 and then I developed diabetes because I know that there's been some information that's been trying to be collected around that. Have you noticed any trends like that within your own practices? You know, that's really interesting. What I've noticed is like some people are put on steroids um, for COVID and then they have this steroid induced diabetes and they are needing some pretty close management. And that's also been a good way with the remote monitoring to be able to do that. So yeah, I think there's so much we don't understand with all this post COVID, the long-term complications that we're continuing to learn about. Um, it's really, it's kind of a currently a very developing field. So on what I see here at the pharmacy, we don't have too many that have been newly diagnosed. I think just recently, maybe one or, or maybe two of them. Um, but m what we're seeing is that more people are now enrolling to try and take advantage of the program and get the education on how to monitor their blood sugar levels. But as far as like being a newly diagnosed after COVID, anything like that, we have not seen that. Okay, great. And then I'm trying to get through the questions here. Questions around um, any related to patients well-being or anything related to uh, just mental health uh, during this time that you've noted with your patients have you seen that impacting either their diabetes or just mental health during the time uh, that you've been working with them during this past year um i'll speak on that yes we've definitely seen and like i said that that's been a big focal point for us as far as stress management um you know finding the stresses, finding, you know, are there any physical symptoms, making sure that, you know, if they're, if they're manifesting, try and get a physical exam if that's available, just kind of rule out any other causes, especially with anxiety, things like that. We are referring them again, not only providing the education, but like explaining that, you know, yes, your diet can be right on point, but you're seeing your higher blood sugars because of stress and, you know, the increase of cortisol, adrenaline, all these other things, and, and kind of trying to explain to them so at least they're aware of that and trying to consciously manage that stress level and do things, trying to, you know, do things for themselves, find hobbies, get outside, get some air, if you're not going to the gym, just get, just do something for yourself. Because um, a lot of it, you know, parents getting uh, kids that are having to do online learning on top of, you know, their own yeah. jobs. And so just the stress management, but also letting them know, okay, you have this resource, you have, you know, Teladoc that just added a behavioral component that you can access free of charge. And so just giving them and trying to be an advocate for them if they need us to help them find further resources. Yeah, the toll on mental health is very, very real. It was a very rough winter for us. I mean, the cases were very, very high in December and it's cold here, it's very cold, it's hard to get out, you can't just go for a walk. And so that burden on that was tremendous and people really struggling, feeling depressed, 
Um, and then right on top of it, having kids at home and the stress of trying to manage them and not being in school and falling behind. And it, it was a tough, tough time. And we're still trying to recover from that. And I think that's an area we don't have, we, we need more mental health resources. It's such, it's so important. And I feel like that's the area where we need, we just need more. We, we, we only have so much. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm trying to be a therapist. Like I'm trying to really, you know, support my patients and give my all and do all I can. And you can tell people feel alone, isolated, and they, they're so happy to talk to you. And it just like breaks your heart that you, you know, you, like you can't do more, you can't solve all your problems. And I think that just shows like, we need a team, we need a village and our psychologists, social workers, you know, mental health professionals are just so important to this team. Oh, I know. We've been experiencing something similar. We do uh, telehealth where I work here with Tabula Rasa and we do comprehensive med reviews. So we proactively call people and it's to do a med review and you end up just identifying so many issues around um, anxiety, depression, isolation. Uh, we started to routinely do a, a social determinants of health survey and just ask some basic questions and then try to connect people to care either through case management or um, even, I don't know if you've all heard of the 211.gov. It's a website to connect people to resources for like housing information, help with utilities, um, other resources, and it's by zip code. So you can punch in a person's zip code and it'll pull resources local to that person's community. So I think that's just a, a clinical pearl for people out there that you know sometimes you get told a lot of information and you don't know what to do. Uh, that website, 211.gov, allows you to look by zip code and then hopefully connect people to resources that they can uh, walk out with and that at least you know you're not just letting them go without any help or assistance. But yeah, definitely connecting back to their providers, caseworkers, behavioral health, if there's somebody locally you can refer to or through telehealth, there's a lot of um, unique options and opportunities now. Um, and a couple more questions here as it relates to visits. Have you seen with telehealth that you were seeing more participation from family members or, you know, wives, husbands, local coaches, things like that within the visits that you're seeing more, more than one person on your visit? Or um, are you still mostly the patient and you directly? For us, mostly it's the patient, but now that they're home and both spouses are there, you kind of get a chime in from the spouse if you're asking about nutrition <laughs> or things like that. But um, but no, they uh, and we always welcome them even in office, you know, to bring their spouse and family members so that they can be a support. I would say more so we have seen just the one on one though. I see a combination. Um, I definitely see spouses. One of the things that's been nice, like sometimes older patients or people that just need more support with the technology, a lot of times I'll see that they'll have someone help them, whether it's you know one of their children or caregiver or whomever uh, will help them set it up. So that's been nice because uh, the traditional barriers that you might think, you know, oh, they, they're not using technology, either they've got a smartphone or someone they know has a smartphone to connect to the virtual visit. So that's been um, been really good. Very good. Let's see. And I have a specific question here around sensors. Um, any experience with differences between them in terms of readings? Uh, when they're changed, it's better place uh, for sensor placement, any coaching around sensors? That's a a specific question, but I don't know if you have any guidance on oh, I that. I have or so any... many thoughts on this. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's so much pharmacists can do in this area. There's a lot to say on it in terms of placements. There's the FDA approved sites, but also we can use clinical judgment. And sometimes a non-FDA approved site works better because someone has a lot of scar tissue there. Um, there's a lot we can do to help people with sensor placement in terms of adhesion and different products to stay on the full amount of time. And then in terms of accuracy, there's so much to say in terms of patient expectations about accuracy that nothing's perfect. You don't even know the source of truth because the meter's not perfect, the sensor's not perfect. So it's about some of the expectations about the trends versus that exact value. And if it's rising or falling, there's gonna be a difference. So there's um, there's definitely a lot to say on this area, but we as pharmacists can do so much and uh, so much virtually to help people. Right, I agree. And the other thing is, being that there's so many different sensors and different uh, uh, requirements, you know, some you have to calibrate, some you don't. But understanding what which one, you know, to get your back at best accuracy, 
how do you utilize it and make sure to educate the patient on that. But there are numerous ones and, and that's one thing that if everybody could be on one, that would be great because you're constantly seeing a feedback on the blood sugar levels. The patients that we switched over, like our type two patients that once we got the freestyle Libres covered, just like in heaven as far as like oh my gosh i can see now you know now i eat this and i thought it usually would affect my blood sugar and it really didn't but this other food that i thought you know didn't actually did so it really gives that feedback as well as you know overnight um and that was mostly with our type twos type ones you know we are able to see what's going on stress levels things like that but again it really depends on which sensor as far as like accuracy things like that there's different things that come into play to make sure that you're getting as, as accurate as possible like you said there there are different so well, Della, that's the great. Things, uh, like I've been struggling with so like with speaking of freestyle Libre there's the, the original 14 day and then there's the Libre 2 so the Libre 2 is more accurate and it has alarms which is great but it doesn't have a mobile app right now so it's like okay do I want my patient to be on this you know better more accurate device or do I want to be able to see the data because if they have if they can use the mobile app then it's really easy to get them connected so that's been one of the the challenges I guess with, with people using that specific device that's where I think they need more patient, um, you know, uh, participation so that they can tell you what things would really help them out. I think all of these devices are 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 good to some degree. And then, you know, there's always something you could do better. But I love it. I love it. I'm loving the fact that you have this experience here. Is there this is a great question. I think this is a really, really good question. Any authorizations during COVID that you have now that you would want to retain post pandemic? Or do you feel like you have the things? Um, that are going to continue uh, anything that you gained during the pandemic any flexibilities in your practice that you want to continue to see well i think being able to build dsmes virtually um is is really important and necessary and i sure hope that that continues and during COVID, that's expanded to allow you know both nurses and pharmacists to be able to do that so i really truly hope that continues also, I mean, there's there's some confusion with this, but you know, depending who you ask, you know, there were some loosening restrictions for Medicare patients to get CGM, and so I would love if things like that could continue to be relaxed to allow more access for for people. Great. And how about you, Tammy? Have you noticed anything from COVID um, that you want to retain post pandemic? Um, I think just the ability to continue to do virtual visits. I yeah. think that we get more. Uh, uh, our visits in if somebody can't make it in at least they have an option if they can't make it we're in a downtown area and you know if someone's working from home it's, just, it's more convenient for them as far as anything major that has changed I mean we're able to transition nothing as far as any um, requirements or any uh, any other protocols that we necessarily have changed um, that were anything majorly different that we had to get approval for or anything like that so I think mainly just having that virtual um, ability and again with having the remote access to their glucometer meters sensors you know anything like that makes it so much easier to manage a patient great and i think this will be our last question here i think it's a good one uh, to finish up with you've been super helpful and wonderful information that you've shared but any pearls to community providers on how they can best meet the needs of the patients that um, with diabetes who are dealing with COVID or during this COVID time? Any practice pearls, anything you think is uh, something that they can take with them? I think on my end, uh, with, you know, talking about sick day guidelines for patients, making sure they're aware of how to manage it, they might need to be monitoring their blood sugar levels more, also getting more testing supplies, kind of being an advocate for the patient if they need to in between the provider, getting, you know, a change in prescriptions, also being on the retail side, you know, advocating for the patient, especially during this, this pandemic of, um, we do three month supplies here, some places don't, but do they know that they're eligible to do that? Can you advocate and say, can we get the patient three months at a time? You know, for us, when they fill a 90 day supply, they could fill three weeks early. If they continually do that, they're gonna get a little bit more to have on hand in case something comes up where there's a shortage where they're not running, you know, directly to where they're out. Um, the other thing that we've done is with patients is we started running reports being that we're the pharmacy benefits manager as well, um, we were running reports on all the people who were due for prescriptions within five days. We did see some people were forgetting to refill their scripts. So we were being an advocate for them saying, hey, you know, do you need this? We see that you're almost running low. Um, or, you know, the, the city's plan, they looked at that, you know, refill too soon option. So, 
you know, still watching it to try to save uh, money towards the plan and not refilling everybody's prescription, but people who need it to say, okay, you're not close enough to where you can come in for a script. Let's see if we can get that for you. Trying to help manage it and really be an advocate for the patient. Great, thank you. Those are great thoughts. Yeah, I think, you know, access to care and having a team is so important. And kind of along the lines of what Tammy was describing, we had so many endocrinology consults but we, the patients we found weren't getting scheduled. And of course, you know, it's it's not the easiest to schedule. I mean, whatever, it's not that hard, but you know, by being proactive, we finally put someone in to call these patients and get them scheduled. And then boom, tons of people were coming in. And we know, I think the scariest thing about the pandemic is all the people that aren't getting care because maybe they're afraid to come in and ignoring conditions like diabetes. So I think we need to reach out to them proactively, show them that we do care, show them that we have a team that's here to support them, that's behind them. And through virtual care, it can be very convenient and we can help them. Absolutely. I 100% echo that. I think uh, people are concerned, are afraid. A lot of people delayed things. I know I personally delayed my own eye appointment and my dental visit until I was vaccinated. And I, I can't imagine, you know, what people are doing. Um, labs too, people delaying labs. And, and so the deferred maintenance, we're definitely going to have to be very helpful in helping people catch up. I'm super excited that pharmacists can now vaccinate kids between three uh, and 18 to hopefully catch up and um, triage and get people back to care. So I wanna thank both of you for your time this morning. You've been phenomenal, um, you're, you're great. Hopefully we can continue to connect with you uh, on Engage and all these other uh, opportunities with the SIGs. But thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, I appreciate everything you, that you do and I'm sure your patients do also. So with that, we're going to transition over to Elisa Bernstein, who's going to give us an update on what's going on with APHA and what's coming up. Hi, thank you. And thanks, Diana and Tammy. That was fabulous. It was very great. A lot of really good, useful, practical information. So what I'm going to share now is some what's been happening. There's always new information coming from uh, the Hill and from the regulatory agencies. And um, so I'm just gonna give you some of the two most recent issues that have been happening and, and very excited to, set, to share, if you haven't heard already, that CMS doubled roughly the payment for COVID-19 vaccine administration. So before, depending on it, if it was a two dose series, the first dose was a, a, a lower payment reimbursement rate and the second was higher. The reasoning, for that was was more or less to encourage and incentivize and to help get patients in for for the second dose. Um, now that there is a single dose vaccine out, it's really time to level the playing field. A jab is a jab, and so what CMS did is they actually said, "All right, we're going to pay roughly forty dollars for each administration." It'll vary a little bit depending on the geographic um, location and adjustments, but whether it's a single dose or multi-dose, each injection and administration is, is gonna be paid out at about $40. That's great news for Medicare. For Medicaid, um, CMS has said to incentivize states that they'll pay 100% of the state-determined vaccine administration rate. So states are starting to work on um, getting some amendments and so that they can up the rate and and include pharmacists as well. Private plans is also are also it's 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 up to them, but CMS said that they'll work with private plans in order to try and get some equity in the reimbursement. So all good news. It's important though that you tell your patients and remind them that they need to bring their red, white, and blue Medicare card so that the payment can be um, billed appropriately to Medicare Part B. So let's go to the next slide. This is all um, immunization vaccine related this week um, because isn't that what it's all about right now? Also last week, uh, APHA, or not APHA, um, HHS expanded the authority and added another, they um, uh, passed another amendment to the PREP Act, which is a Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act. This is the act that has been used by HHS to increase authority of pharmacists and other healthcare professionals to do more things um, and preempt states with respect to scope of practice. And it also provides uh, liability protection. What they did last week 
is, and this is something that APHA had called for and um, worked with HHS on, and, and um, that is expanding it for retired and inactive pharmacists and pharmacy interns who have been licensed and actively within the last five years. This helps retired pharmacists help jump in. The PrEP Act also authorized pharmacy students and interns and other healthcare professionals to, um, with appropriate training to also jump in and that students and interns can be supervised by other healthcare professionals as long as they're qualified. So this will help students and interns who are working at mass vaccination sites and don't necessarily have uh, supervision of a pharmacist. So that, that's a really another great win um, for a pharmacy, pharmacy stu student pharmacists and interns. Um, the, oh, so the, the chart here though, if you're all familiar, if you're familiar, I hope you're all familiar with APHA's practice resources, know the facts. Um, we have, actually, if you go back one, we have one specifically related to authority the different authorities that HHS has granted under the PREP Act. We will be um, posting an updated version tomorrow that includes this new information from the Seventh Amendment um, of the PREP Act that came out. So going to the next slide, thank you. Again, here is, the. if you haven't bookmarked this, the APHA's COVID resource, Know the Facts, please bookmark it. It's wealth of information. We are constantly updating the, our resources as new information comes available. So um, we're, we're just updated the COVID vaccine summary chart, which has on one, in one document, a comparison of all the three authorized vaccines. So check that out. And on the next slide, we'll, um, just a reminder of our CE opportunities. We've we're bringing back and have brought back some of our 15 on 19. Um, uh, this is the short, quick CE and 15 minutes. Um, and we also have a one hour new program uh, with a really great overview of the, the Janssen vaccine. And I think I'm going to turn it back over to Sandra right now. So thank you. Thank you, Elisa. There's so much uh, new information. Thank you for keeping us uh, informed with the latest and greatest breaking information. So appreciate that. Uh, we do have a survey that we would love for you to complete. This is a survey that um, essentially addresses uh, pharmacists' need, needs on assessment of diabetes equipment and technology. And there was a lot of uh, questions around sensors and continuous glucose monitors. So if you could please take a few moments to uh, complete this survey. There's a double win here. They're gaining information about pharmacist awareness and engagement with different diabetes technology. Uh, but when you complete the survey, um, the APHA Foundation also receives uh, a little bit of a financial um, uh, donation as a result of you completing the survey. So there's a double win there. So please take the time uh, to do this, this survey. Uh, in the next slide, please. Uh, I talked a little bit about Engage, but this is a wonderful community. I can encourage you uh, more to, to share, post, and uh, help support your colleagues here. Uh, you get great information. I get the daily digest every morning and then the weekly digest in case I missed anything, but there's a lot of really good uh, resources, webinars that are shared. They talk a lot about the SIGs and what they're working on, and you'll find colleagues like Tammy and Diana participating there also. So please post, share, support each other, um, and hopefully you can find some of the latest resources on COVID-19 or anything else that you're working on. So uh, please join that. And the last slide today is a little bit of information on the next webinar, which will be on Thursday, April 8th. So this is going to be a CE and it's going to be myths versus facts on vaccine hesitancy. Um, so just to remind everybody, uh, this is every other week now, so we're trying to space them out a little. We, we can definitely have one in between in case there's some breaking news, but we hope you'll join us for that. And we will have a, a recording of today's webinar and slides available within 24 hours. You can see the link that's listed there. And I want to just take a moment to, again, thank the speakers today. We had some wonderful information. Um, it's really exciting to start uh, my first as president here with you today, and uh, especially on a topic that's really 
dear to my heart. That's the practice that I used to have uh, for a long time before uh, doing what I'm currently doing. So I appreciate having this topic beyond diabetes to kick things off. And thank you all for joining. Hopefully we'll see you on Engage. Um, if not, we'll see you on April 8th for this next uh, CE. Have a very good rest of your week and a very good weekend and stay healthy and stay safe.